Welcome, Gabby, to Mint. How are you doing? Thank you for being on. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be here. As we both know, it's been a long time coming. So it's been a I'm long excited. time coming, but uh, we're here now. And uh, when I post it on Twitter and other platforms, people have a bunch of questions to ask you. So we'll have to get into that as well. But I think a good place to start, first and foremost, is who are you, Gabby? What does the world need to know about you? Uh, we can start there and then we'll move forward. Sure. So my name is Gabby Goldberg. I'm an investor at TCG Crypto. So maybe we can get into it in a little bit, but we are a crypto consumer fund really focusing on figuring out what scale looks like in Web3 and really focusing on investing in passion, whether that's passion found in gaming or in music or in art or in new markets that have yet to be really discovered and brought to market, but really finding areas where people are spending a lot of time and a lot of their energy and oftentimes a lot of money in these really passionate areas and figuring out how crypto either unlocks or, or supercharges that behavior. Um, and so we've invested in companies like Rabbit Hole and Archive and Hume and a suite of others that we're really excited to be partnered with. And yeah, I spend a lot of my time now thinking both personally and obviously professionally as well about digital identity, internet culture, and kind of these pockets of the internet where I think passion is emerging. Are we happy with the current state of uh, consumer in Web3? It's a good question. You know, no one ever asks me how I feel about it. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, listen, I mean, we have a long way to go. And I think also just totally candidly, the more time I spend in the space, the more I realize that there's so much I don't know and um, so much that we need to do kind of as an ecosystem to create better consumer products and experiences to support these either new or emerging behaviors. Um, there are definitely some certain areas that are early, but I'm really excited about. So one of them is kind of online credentialing and how we figure out what a sense of identity and reputation looks like online across both Web 2 and Web 3. Um, a big place where I'm interested in spending time and investing in is sort of new interfaces for these consumer experiences. So hopefully we'll talk about wallets yeah. in a little bit, but I think kind of like wallets as an interface for interacting with Web 3 is largely kind of underexplored and really excited about areas like that. So um, I'm happy about it because I'm happy to be here and I learn so much every day, but we definitely have a long way to go. What would you say are some of the unique behaviors that Web3 users have that differ from Web2 users, for example? Mm. Interesting question. So so I have sort of like a, a framework for consumer that okay. actually I think in in a lot of ways stretches across web two and web three. And it's basically this uh, four question sequence. So why do people come? Why do people stay? Why do people share? And why do people pay? And I'll kind of break them down and explain some of these unique kind of web three specific areas and answers to these questions. So why do people come is actually probably the most important one of what uh, kind of you know, creates this divide between Web 2 and Web 3. A big reason why people come and try out Web 3 products is because of a financial incentive to try them out. Maybe there's a hope of an airdrop or there's another like, kind of like active token incentive to go use a product and spend time there versus on a competing ecosystem or platform. Um, and so a good example, uh, the Blur airdrop even yesterday the amount of activity you even are just seeing on Etherscan and other block explorers of dormant wallets that now have become active because of this financial opportunity um, in a lot of ways is pure speculation. So um, it brings a lot of these people to these platforms. Uh, so it kind of leads us to the second question of why do people stay? And I think this is actually really the important thing. And so when I think about investing in Web3 consumer platforms, um, they can come for a token. Maybe there's, you know, that financial speculation that kind of piques their interest and they want to see what's there. Obviously, it's kind of just like human nature to want to have that incentive to go try out a product. But if they're staying because of that financial incentive or if they're staying in the hopes that that token goes up and gives them some sort of financial return, it's largely unsustainable. I think Stepin is a good example there of they did an amazing job of acquiring a lot of users um, in a lot of ways, people who had never interacted with crypto before downloaded the step in app and set up a crypto wallet for the first time to be able to earn this token. And that's fine. Like as a means of, 
you know, clever acquisition hacks. I think it was super smart. Um, but in terms of sustainability of why are they staying there? If they're only staying there because of the token, then at some point, like the music stops. Right. Um, and so it's kind of a helpful framework that I use to kind of think about these behaviors. And so the, the financialization of all of these applications is not something to be overlooked, right? It's, um, one of like the most special parts about crypto, but I think sometimes you can kind of fall down that rabbit hole and, you, you know, like lose the forest for the trees. So why do people come? Why do people stay? There are two more sections, right? Why do people share and okay. why do people pay? Okay. So why do people share, especially for consumer products? Um, you know, where's your distribution coming from? Right. Um, I actually had like a little screenshot essay on Twitter a couple days ago about basically being good at social apps, um, kind of an extension of Eugene Way's status as a service. And I was talking about specifically Web3 applications that I think are really interesting from a creator perspective when you see this flywheel getting created of um, take Dune Analytics, for example, people who call themselves Dune Wizards create these on-chain dashboards of what's going on in crypto. And it's largely limited to just that platform, right? You go onto Dune to see what's going on, but the amount that those dashboards get shared cross platform and people flex the fact that they're a Dune wizard, it adds this brand equity across platform for Dune and it makes Dune better as a platform when these creators can kind of rise in influence um, from Dune. And so you see that on other platforms as well. In the screenshot essay, I was also talking about block explorers and how I think something similar could emerge there of you see you know, the Nansen interns and Zach XBTs of the world who are these quote unquote on-chain sleuths. And they share these screen caps either from Nansen or from Etherscan or some other block explorer about cool things they're finding on chain. And it brings brand equity back to that platform. So why do people share is kind of where is that distribution coming from? I think those are two good examples. And then the last one obviously is why do people pay? This is a super interesting one. Um, in the case of Web3 native business models, and maybe we can get into it now or later, but the whole conversation around creator royalties is a really, really good example of this question, why do people pay, not totally being answered. And um, yeah, I, I think it's a helpful framework because the questions are actually quite simple. Right. And if you don't have simple answers to them, right. Um, it's like probably worth exploring. The biggest challenge that I come with your first question, why do people come is when you try to build a network effect based off tokens, then you misinterpret what product market fit sort of looks like because people, a whole sleuth, like you said, of people sort of come in to grab the token while it's wake up from, from the dead and they claim, maybe they dump, maybe they hang out, but it's hard to really figure out who the user is that really enjoys your product and why why they're actually enjoying your product, right? I feel like it's a, it's a it's a it's a common problem that a lot of Web three projects fall fall for, right? When they issue a token, how do you how do you come around that? How do you solve that problem? Yeah, I actually for consumer products, the only place where I've seen tokens perhaps seem to really work, and it's hard. We're still so early, and so over a long enough time horizon, it's hard to know how these things will change. But generally, for products that you can basically you know, zero to one requires the token, but then from one to N, uh, the switching costs are very high and users are unlikely to churn, then a token might make sense. Um, if obviously there's a real business model underlying it and there's kind of like a sync for, for the token itself. Um, so for example, a Web3 Uber that requires active work, zero to one as an acquisition hack with a token, but then one to N, you still need drivers who might churn to other platforms that feels really tough to defend. So uh, candidly, that's where I've found kind of the most conviction in tokens in that kind of business model for acquisition. Um, but I totally agree with what you're saying. I think in a lot of ways, companies in crypto are essentially IPOing too soon by launching a token. And now you're basically at the mercy of the public markets. And once sort of consumer perception of the product has changed, it's really hard to go back. Um, and it's why I like seeing products that deliberately try to stay small and focus on engaged users and don't care about the numbers. Farcaster is a good example. I know we're both big fans. I saw even a post from Dan, it was either today or last night, saying that Farcaster is growing too fast and they have to cap the wait list to keep it smaller because you run the risk of having like an eternal September incident where 
too many new people come into Farcaster and essentially overthrow kind of like the anchored culture uh, or norms of the existing network and you risk ruining all the quality that you've built so far. And so I think that's a, a mature and, and smart way of approaching it. How did you get your interest uh, in Web3 consumer? I feel like everybody's sort of investing in infra uh, and just a bunch of like infrastructure plays. And there's only a few people that sort of stand out across crypto Twitter and whatnot that enjoy consumer. I feel like I'm, I'm one of them. I really enjoy like the end user experience. Um, and I guess maybe that may even tie back to your background, like prior to crypto, is there, is there any sort of connection within that? Yeah, I can, I can definitely talk about background and I also, um, want to pull an Uno reverse card and hear the same for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but first I think it's an interesting sort of thought experiment to explore what is infrastructure and what is an application. This is completely taken from David Phelps, who I've been really lucky to kind of work with and learn from over the past year or two. Um, but I think it was either in a tweet or just in a conversation with him. I'll try and find it after. But um, he basically was saying that everything is infrastructure for something else. It's a little bit silly. So kind of just like humor me for a second. But take planes, for example. The invention of the airplane was infrastructure for the airport, which was infrastructure for travel agents which was infrastructure for D2C luggage companies, which was infrastructure for so many people flying that now you have TSA pre-check, which mm. is infrastructure for clear. And like, it, it goes and goes and goes, but um, basically saying that like apps beget infrastructure, which beget apps and like the cycle continues. And so in a lot of ways, there's also um, a great post that is shared very widely across Web3 called the myth of the infrastructure cycle from USV. And it's a little bit similar. Um, so I try not to separate them so much. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, consumer behaviors that are emerging can beget interesting, you know, I guess you could call them pieces of infrastructure. Um, so for example, people acting as on-chain sleuths shows that there's a real market opportunity for like better block explorers. And honestly, I've talked about that a lot over the last month. So I'll, I'll shut up about it on this podcast, <laughs> but um, that's a good example. So okay. that's the first thing I'll say of just like, what is infrastructure? But certainly I spend a lot of my time thinking about real consumer experiences and looking at interesting consumer behaviors online. So the story starts... <laughs> when I was born, um, but, but going way, <laughs> going going way back, going way back, I actually grew up selectively mute, which is kind of crazy. But for a number of years, I grew up not saying anything, and this also, you know, partly because of my age, coincided with me spending a lot of time on the internet in the early days. And so I grew up playing a ton of Minecraft and a ton of RuneScape. I had a viral Tumblr blog when I was a teenager. Please, nobody go try and find it. But spent a lot of time basically crafting a sense of a digital identity and particularly having a lot of online friends. Um, and these networks were really, really important to me. And then as I grew up and I went to school, I became really interested in how this was shifting and especially seeing everybody else around me, either having had similar experiences as a kid or starting to have really similar experiences now. And I think now there's a, there's a statistic where it's like 60 or 65% of Gen Z believe that their online identity is more important than their identity in real life. And you hear that at first and you're like, that's crazy. But then you think about it and it's like, okay, I got all of my jobs from people that I met online. So many of my friends I met online. Actually, I'm going on a weekend trip this weekend with three amazing girls who I all met online, which is insane. And we've been friends for three years, things like that. Um, and so basically this question of like, what is a digital identity? What is a real life identity? When do they start to become the same thing? Uh, is very interesting for me. Um, and then I guess the other thing around kind of like, digital identity, like the mm -hmm. shift that I think is really interesting, um, is basically this very high level thesis of when the first wave of social apps really came around. So like MySpace or early days of Facebook, for example, they were all about how do we take our real life friends or our real life experiences and bring them online 
So for example, Facebook was taking your college friends and bringing them online. And even in the early days of Instagram, right? Like how do we take photos that we take in real life and put them online? Right. And so obviously no surprise for those use cases, those platforms worked really, really well. And we spent a ton of time online so much so that we started to have these digital native experiences. And so I guess you'll kind of see where I'm going with this. It stretches across web two and mm -hmm. web three. Right. But as an example, we don't just take pictures anymore. We take screenshots and we put a ton of screenshots on Instagram or screenshots on TikTok. And now screenshots are kind of like the photos of our digital life. Or we don't just buy physical art. We buy digital art. There's a huge market for people who love to buy digital art and flex what they have in these online galleries. Um, the sense of these like internet native domain names and senses of identity are really important to us. And so... I guess at a high level across crypto or not just thinking about consumer products and our lives online, I'm really interested in the products that help us better share and understand what digital experiences look like. So I think you, you also asked me like, why do I care about consumer? Like where does my mm -hmm. interest come from? Simply because I don't know how to code um, and all my interactions come from being an end user, right? Um, and using all these different products across web three has really opened my eyes to kind of like tasting the sugar in web two and realizing what are we missing in web three from a, from an end user experience specifically. So mint is all about the creator economy, right? Documenting the creator economy in web three, a lot of creators that try to transition from web two into web three, they try to bring their audiences with them, their followers across TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, whatever, and try to bring them into web three. One of the things that I consistently see fail over and over and over again is the funnel of bringing in a user from Web 2 into Web 3. Like, how do you migrate an audience member, a fan, to then get them to collect an NFT, right? And, like, there's so much in between that, that's involved that the, the, the process is completely broken. So I face this myself, right, trying to bring more of my listeners from Spotify into Web 3 or my subscribers from YouTube into Web 3. And the creators that I see, they also struggle with that, right? So I think a lot of my my interest comes from just merely being an end user and being a super user in, in crypto and trying so many different things, realizing where the inconsistencies are. And yeah, I guess like falling, falling, like having a knack for it, from, from my opinion. I feel like you, you approach it from like the investment perspective, but also from the end user's perspective, I guess I approach it from like, okay, I create content. I try to build audiences, right? What tools can I use in Web3 to sort of allow me that, to empower that and scale that? scale that operation. That's so, sort of how I yeah. think about it. Well, and I, I like that you called it a tool of like, it's not, you know, it, web three is like a means to, to something else that's, that's more important. Right. And it's not even like, it's this sort of like pot of gold at the end of the rainbow where we need to onboard people. So they can buy an NFT. It's like, no, like you have this NFT, what can you do with it? What does it give you access to? Like, how does it make your communities more engaged or more retentive? And I think the fact that you have to think about it as a tool is, is really important. So within your, within your thesis of, I guess, Web3 Social and your love for consumer, where do you think curation plays a role in all of this? Yeah, so I wrote about curation actually before I was working full-time in Web3. And I basically said that there's a ton of noise online. There's so much new information being created every day. And that the real opportunities in the future are going to be in people who understand how to sort signal from noise. and can basically have that trickle down effect of, of curating and then curators who will curate that. And then you keep curating all the way down and you as a user or as kind of like a, yeah, as a user of the internet, you're going to want to put your trust in these curators to tell you what's worth spending your time and attention on. Um, and actually there were a bunch of people who are friends of mine now, but were in Web3 and read this and they were like, Gabby, you're missing the point. This is crypto. Um, and so it's been cool kind of seeing how that thesis has changed for me and how I've learned over time. I think actually in my ideal world, I don't know if this will ever happen, but my kind of like ideal end state for curation is maybe every asset or every piece of content on the internet is traceable and has provenance like, like an NFT mm -hmm. and you can track the quote unquote mileage of a piece of content on the web. So a good example is actually I have a fair number of friends who work in crypto, but kind of got into the space because they were running these really big Instagram accounts, um, like the at girl account or, you know, like just girly things or whatever, but like these sort of meme accounts that got really, really big and 
essentially a lot of these accounts accounts don't create any net new information. All they do is they take screenshots of, you know, at the time Tumblr or tweets and they, you know, or existing memes and they basically curate them onto these pages and they have these really engaged audiences and then they make their money in the DMs by negotiating sponsorships. And it's crazy that so much value is created from these pages that don't actually create any unique content of their own. And they still exist today. I follow a ton of them. But how interesting would it be if all of those pieces of content were traceable back to the original place that they existed online? And perhaps there were streamed payments back to the original creators of that content. There's actually an interesting curation protocol that I've been seeing emerge online, but I really don't know too much about it. So I guess this is my alpha on the podcast, but (laughs) it's the Entropy Twitter account. It's like Entropy with three N's or something like that. And there's a bunch of really interesting assets or like pieces of media or pieces of content being curated. And you can see individuals are curating them through this protocol. But what's really interesting is this account Entropy has been able to build up such a powerful and large following in a short amount of time by being someone who can separate that signal from noise. And it's a really, really high value part of the stack to exist in on the internet. Um, So generally like this idea of internet native brands created by way of curation is very interesting. On Instagram, some of the ones that I think are interesting are Hidden New York or New Bottega or Furniture Archive. And the people behind this account, like they don't make money by um, having their own personality on the account, but it's just the things that they've curated and mm-hmm. their taste. And it's it's particularly interesting. I, I write about this in one of my pieces, but basically the impression to entertain like a TikToker who's like dancing, no hate to that at all. It's like also a huge, very interesting <laughs> conversation, but the impression to entertain like someone like that on TikTok um, versus the ability to convert someone to making a purchase are largely kind of misunderstood as being the same thing. And they're very different. And the latter, you know, the ability to convert someone to make a purchase, you see it happen a lot with these anonymous curatorial identities online. Specifically in Web3, some of the interesting ones are uh, collector DAOs. So for example, TCG Crypto, we hold a seat in Flamingo DAO, which pools capital together to basically curate NFTs across the web. Um, or we also invested recently in a company called archive, which aims to be the first decentralized physical museum, curating these one of one physical assets and wrapping them in a smart contract. And essentially with both of these examples, Flamingo archive, where you can think of pleaser or fingerprints, or, you know, all of these other kind of collector DAO examples, you can think of it sort of as this analogy, you go to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa but you also go to see the Mona Lisa because it's in the Louvre. And by way of collecting valuable pieces of art and culture, the Louvre has created this sense of brand equity that now the assets they continue to curate will appreciate in value by way of being underneath that umbrella and that brand. And you're starting to see similar things happen with these internet native brands like Flamingo, like Archive, like Hidden New York or New Bottega, right? The screenshots that they take and put on these curatorial accounts help drive trends forward. Um, and so that sense of curation is super interesting to me. Never thought about it like that. That's that's really interesting. Your perspective taught me something new. Where, where do you think curation plays a role sort of like in a cl- cross-platform setting? So whether it be multi-chain, for example. Yeah, multi-chain I haven't even thought about. Um, although there are interesting uh, examples, like I believe it's called Quixotic, which is helping to basically aggregate collections uh, in like a multi-chain perspective. Um, Ideally, it's something like this, this idea of having pieces of content minted as NFTs and you can track them cross-platform. I was thinking more in the sense of tracking them, you know, from Tumblr to Twitter Mm. to Instagram and seeing the flow of media um, as it goes through the hands of different people. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen a real example of it working yet, although the entropy example is a good one. When you think about digital identity, what is like the picture perfect scenario five years from now? Like what does a digital identity really look and feel like? What are the actions end users are taking with their digital identity? What is that? What does that environment look and feel like? Yeah. So I guess kind of starting, you know, totally from the beginning, 
When we think about the internet today, it really was created without a native identity layer for people. And so you see kind of like the the coping mechanism for this is digital identity was really relegated to websites and applications, right? I have an identity on Instagram and I have an identity on Facebook and I have an identity, you know, on SMTP with email. And this kind of siloed approach may have been appropriate for the early days of the internet, because obviously how could we have imagined where we've ended up now? But now with billions of people online every single day, there's real drawbacks to having this siloed approach to identity that's not owned by the user themselves. And so you see, you know, we still use usernames and passwords for just about everything, even though they're obviously an insecure model, right? If your Twitter gets hacked, you've basically lost a major sense of your identity. Um, And even still, even if you don't get hacked, you are renting your identity essentially from companies and centralized entities. Um, And so my identity in a lot of ways kind of like belongs to Facebook when I connect my Facebook to all of these different applications. And so when we think about digital identity in the context of Web3, it's really this premise that each user on the internet will have a unique identifier, right? Gabby.eth is a good example. And you can natively link it to any piece of software and it's stored on a blockchain. So it has that sense of provenance. Um, Now it becomes sort of like opt-in, right? Instead of, you know, like I can decide where I take my identity and where I plug it into and kind of the experiences that I choose to have on the identity on on the internet right. and the identity is kind of shared across all of these platforms if i choose that makes sense so who will end up owning sort of the 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 um i want to say like the, the the web of all these identity pieces from your off-chain identity to your on-chain identity is that like a, mm. is that an infrastructure play is that a single company play like what is that a, a a decentralized play it obviously hopefully will all live on chain right in a, in a very decentralized manner right but what what does that look like from an application level yeah yeah so i'll need to pause to think about how i really want to answer this um, and I and I think we're already seeing like pieces of this thesis sort of unfold. You brought up ENS as a great example. That's one single piece. And then you have other companies and projects building out other pieces of the puzzle, right? And yep. we as users, we find out what we latch onto and we sort of piece them together by default, by opt-in, right? Like we connect yep. our ENS username to our Twitter handle because that, that appropriates us and makes us fit in with culture, right? And we find friends yep. like that, right? Do you think it's going to play out like that big picture or is there going to be some type of like centralized entity that's able to sort of like take control this entire, this entire, uh, I guess, thesis around decentralized identity? What do you think? Yeah. So I guess the first thing I'll say is when I say all of this, I don't think that companies like Facebook or Twitter or our existing senses of kind of like siloed centralized identity are going to go away. Um, And perhaps I shouldn't say this on the podcast, but I'm not a decentralization maximalist. I think there are a lot of products that will (laughs) continue to exist. But when we think about a decentralized identity, um, I like to think about it from beginning with the wallet, right? So my view is that in five years, the wallet really is going to be one of the most important pieces of consumer data for individuals, but also for businesses, right? If I'm a business and I can have the users who are, or the consumers who are super engaged in whatever I do, whether it's a community or a brand or something else, connect their wallet. Now I get to know who they are. I get to know their spending habits. I get to know what other communities and brands they're aligned with and figure out what cross promotion might be highly effective. Um, And also if they have that sense of identity there, right, with an ENS, ideally then I can talk to them, right? And tell them, you know, with, you know, by connecting your wallet, here are the experiences and access points that you have that previously were unavailable to you. And here are the interesting collaborations that we can create to make experiences for you as a user of our product better. Um, And so starting from the wallet, I think makes sense in that sense. Um, And then ideally also connecting your off-chain information there as well. So, you know, OpenSea, you connect your wallet, but they also, for a lot of us, they have our email as well. And that's the way that right now OpenSea can talk to us. And so right. perhaps in the future, uh, like a real native Web3 communication layer will bring more things on chain. But for now, I think a hybrid makes a lot of sense. I think ultimately the way I see it is that it's going to be a bunch of independent products in companies that try to piece all that data together. 
And the way they do it is going to be through various problems that the user needs solving. So for example, right, there's this company um, or this product called Link3, okay? They are a community Calendly and they're able to sort of link wallet addresses now to, uh, to Discord handles, to Twitter handles, to all these sort of like really important data points that creators and communities need, but they do it through an opt-in way, right? When a, when a member wants to join a Twitter space, they can RSVP via Link3 and they self opt in and fill out all that data themselves, right? And then Link3 provides that data to the community hosts, right? So when I sort of think about like what the, the interconnected da data layer looks like, I really think it's from a product perspective of different products being built that sort of intertwine that, that information together, right? It's like, for example, something that I do on the podcast is that I, I give out free NFTs to my listeners. I've been able to build out a substantial database of wallet addresses linked to Ethereum addresses, right? Or uh, uh, wallet addresses linked to email addresses, right? In a, in a way that's very organic and opt-in because I create content via my newsletter and then I reward people for reading and listening and, and, and clicking and sharing my content with an NFT down the line, right? And it's all sort of been opt-in. I think the interesting perspective is trying to make sense of all that data for whoever's capturing it, number one, right? Whether it be the creator who's building an audience on chain where now they have interoperable fans, right? That they can take cross-platform with them and sort of what that data means for them. Because I think there's also a level of responsibility and a, le a level of, uh, um, I guess, like, I guess responsibility is the right word of understanding what that data really means, right? And how you can use it mm -hmm. to your benefit to create better experiences, activations, monetize better as an individual, as a creator, as a brand, as an enterprise, whatever it may be. Um, are you thinking about it the same way or what are your thoughts? Yes. And I love, I love what you said about giving the free NFTs to your listeners. Um, NFTs as a business model, I think largely is continuing to be developed. I think the smartest approach that I have seen is not using NFTs as like the primary way of accruing revenue to a business, but instead figuring out how to strengthen the relationship between, um, basically the business or the individual or the brand or the community and your audience. And so even we have a portfolio company, Medallion, which is doing this with uh, musicians and essentially creating super fan clubs on chain. But the idea is the NFT is not the end goal, right? The NFT is not the driver of revenue for the musician, but instead they want to figure out who their biggest fans are. What if you minted a free NFT that acted as an access pass into this community. And then once you're there, what are the things that you can do with these wallets? And it becomes really, really interesting. The level of engagement that you start to see with these communities and with these fan clubs. Um, in gaming, I also think it's a really interesting and underexplored model where investors in a company called Branch, which launched a game called Castaways, which is one of a couple games really pioneering this quote unquote free to own model, where you can have these free NFTs that are you know in-game playable assets but now when you have ownership of these assets and you create these digital worlds and these micro economies within them, now the sense of building something of value and building something that is meaningful within the game becomes so much more real because you add real world liquidity to the game. And so you're seeing people go into castaways and they have these islands that were minted for free and they go to the islands and they build these incredible little worlds on them, right? And maybe they're catching all of the fish and now they have a monopoly on fish or maybe they've got the biggest house on that island and now other people want to be a part of that tribe. And so now you're seeing the secondary market for these islands become amazing where it's not a typical land sale where you want to buy the most expensive island. Maybe you buy the worst one, right? And you build it up into something of meaning. Now that economy becomes something really, really interesting and valuable. Um, but it all starts with that free NFT, right? It shouldn't be pay to play. Another great example is G Money's Admit One. It's all free to mint, a thousand yep. editions. And it did hundreds of thousands of, of, in dollars of, of secondary sales and was able to sort of sustain the project until where, where it is right now. Another good example is there's this creator or music artist named Sound of Fractures. He literally just did a drop yesterday on sound.xyz, was able to uh, sort of like mint out uh, for free, of course, but mint out 500 editions of his new song using NFTs as a tool for distribution, right? So the more people that sort of got their hands on the song, the more people listen to it, right? So it's not about like the 25 sort of collectors that you typically see from, from music artists. But what's really cool is that now he has hundreds of addresses that he can now sort of like tap into and build like a top, like leverage this top level funnel of free collectors and find ways to monetize them down the line, right? 
And I, yep. and I love that approach so much because it's so much easier to give first than to take. And by giving, you're now able to give with purpose and get all this information on chain on an aggregate level and be able to create really cool experiences based off what's in their wallet, for example, right? And based off what they like. I try to do this with the podcast too. I noticed that a lot of my, my collectors across season two, three, four, five, and soon six, they collect on different platforms. They like buying different NFTs. And I've been starting to create content around the things that they're collecting because I've noticed that that's what they like. So I might as well sort of like create content around that. And it's helped me a lot as a creator too. I've seen like upticks in, in episode downloads. I've been able to find new sponsorship opportunities through that. So I don't know. I, I love this whole concept of like uh, of wallet information, wallet data. Um, I think still it's incredibly underexplored, but I think in the next bull market, it's going to be one of those big narratives that people are going to be latching in, latching, latching onto, excuse me, and uh, using to their benefit. 100%. There, there are so many places I want to take this. I think uh, this kind of like free to mint opportunity as a clever acquisition hack is so important. The whole thing is just an acquisition game, right? How do you get the wallets? And then once you have them, that's not the end goal, but what do you do with them? Okay. There are a few points that you brought up that I think are so interesting. So I'm trying to decide which order I want to yes, tackle them in. Um, I think the first one I want to touch on is the whole creator royalties debate and it's very topical. Um, but the fact that, you know, a lot of like the most exciting projects right now are minting initially as free mints is I think an interesting place to start. So generally on the creator royalties argument, obviously to bring folks up to speed, a bunch of the major marketplaces, uh, Magic Eden probably being the most notable one, uh, kind of moved towards optional creator royalties. So royalties that stream out to the original creator of an NFT are not actually enforceable on chain. Um, it's at a marketplace level. And so now when you see the rise of other marketplaces like PseudoSwap, for example, that don't enforce those royalties at all, people have been a little bit surprised that nobody actually wants to support these creators. And instead they're going so that they can have a cheaper transaction on a marketplace like PseudoSwap. And so it's very hard to enforce these things now. What's the moat of a marketplace like Magic Eden when you have this extra transaction fee? And so that's why they've added the optional, uh, the optional, you know, you know, the option to have royalties or not for buyers and sellers. So for me, I think the problem is twofold. The first one is companies believing that they could use secondary sales and the royalties from those secondary sales as a primary means of generating revenue, right? Obviously it can be one line on the balance sheet, but as a primary means of generating revenue, I think it's a problem because when you have a lot of liquidity and you have a lot of secondary sales and you're calling yourself a community, what you actually have is churn. You have people leaving the community every time a sale is made. And particularly by taking a royalty on that, you're you're implicitly kind of agreeing and you're okay with the fact that your community is churning. So I think that to begin is an issue. And number two, these companies call themselves communities and they are lying to themselves by believing that communities can be sustainable and successful by making their primary means of revenue on liquidity and a constant churn of members. And so I don't believe it was the right way to launch a real community to begin with. And if you're a company, you have to be okay with having a ton of churn in your business and your user base to be able to make money. And so eventually like who becomes the buyer when the last buyer sells, right? So I think that is the main issue. I think my view on what will end up happening, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but generally my prediction is that these major kind of aggregated marketplaces who are similar to like the Craigslist or eBay of NFT marketplaces. So like Magic Eden and OpenSea, et cetera, will not be able to enforce royalties on chain um, because people will just move to other marketplaces. However, I think generally as a trend, you're seeing brands and companies and communities in Web2 and, or sorry, in Web3, but also in Web2 want to own more of their relationship with their audience. So for example, you're seeing the rise of all of these kind of verticalized secondary marketplaces powered by companies like Reservoir or Hyperspace or First May or all of these interesting companies that allow brands to launch their own secondary marketplace embedded on their site. I think we're going to see that continue to happen where brands and companies want to own the relationship with their audience. And perhaps then if, you know, 
you're selling things directly on your site and you hope that uh, kind of like secondary sales to continue to take place on your site, then you can say, okay, you have to buy them on our site. And if you do, and we see that it was minted or sold or, you know, went on secondary from our site, then, then you have access to all of these perks and, you know, benefits that you have from being a part of the company or the community for the NFT as, as, as kind of a tool. And sure, you can sell it anywhere else and, and not pay royalties, but you won't have that same level of access. So actually, D-Gods, before they went fully zero royalties, did something similar. And I thought that that was clever. Um, and so, of course, it's not enforceable on chain, but, but brands and communities and companies are still going to have that level of control over, you know, what you actually get, depending on how the transaction went through. Um, but I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. I think creators are going to end up flocking to the network or the platform that's able to enforce uh, royalties. If you remember, um, or something that I paid attention to really early on during like the nifty gateway era of NFTs, right? That initial, initial heat wave of artists, corporate artists, Instagram artists flocking from web two into web three, using NFTs as a tool to, to tokenize their art, make living, right? All these really cool things that NFTs sort of became known and loved for from from creators is now being taken away from them, right? It's like it's a it's a weird sort of uh, it's a it's a weird thing for those who came in during that era. For those who come in after this debate, right? I think it's just going to be one of those things that they're just going to have to expect and, and go with, right? Um, but I I there hasn't been another industry or another sort of like technology or another sector that's been able to implement this level of transparency and this level of automation, the same way smart contracts have been able to. And that has really much so favored uh, the creator. And I think creators really like that. I mean, who, who wouldn't like that as a creator, right? Um, I'm in favor of creator royalties. I think they're great. I think they're really, really great by design. And I think it's needed. I think it's really cool to be able to figure out and use the, the tool in different ways to sort of create monetization, whether it be through the primary sale or the secondary sale. Um, and I don't think it should be stripped away. So again, I alluded to earlier, I'm not technical. I don't know how to code. So I don't really understand how, how, the, how the, the, the technicality sort of looks and feels like. And if, if there is a way to make it enforceable, I'm not sure. But I think if there's a platform that gets created in the future that prioritizes royalties, maybe to some extent, I think um, the creators will sort of flock to that, in my opinion. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not I, sure. actually, I actually had a tweet last week. I just put it in the chat. It's sort of similar. I basically said, or I'll, I'll just read it aloud. I see a world where a new artist focused NFT marketplace is spun up featuring top artists and up and coming projects. And the only buyers allowed on the site are those who have opted into paying royalties on competing marketplaces. Oh, I love the share screen. Yeah, so you can see it here. Who knows? I mean, I, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I think particularly it would work with one of one artists. Um, I don't know if like 10K projects, first of all, I'm, I'm just curious to see the, longe the longevity of 10K projects in general, but I don't know if creator royalties are as enforceable for projects like that. But I think particularly for one of one artists or NFT photographers or things like that, where there's really that intimate relationship with the creator and the buyer. I do think they're going to be enforceable in, in that kind of sense. I also think it's kind of messed up to, to not enforce them because we're still playing and building in a world with constraints, right? And if we want to tap into mass adoption, we need to rely on mobile as being one of those driving factors. And if we're building around Apple's guidelines of their 30% uh, take rate, right? It's really hard to issue NFTs on primaries at that level. And that's why you have really creative people thinking of like free to own as a, as a perfect model for building an, an MBC, right? A minimum viable community, right? Mm. And sort of like bootstrapping liquidity up from secondary sales. So I'm not sure. I'm, And that's why I'm like also excited for technologies like the Solana phone, right? Because while it may not end, end up being like the end all be all type of phone, I think it stands a chance depending on how, how well it's executed um, to sort of like enable an, a new sort of adoption curve. And when we're talking about Web3 social or not Web3 consumer, excuse me, it's like... It's like building all these new sort of products and platforms and protocols that tailor the needs, wants, and desires of the Web3 native user, right? And the Web3 native needs, wants, and desires are completely different than those of the Web2 users, right? So it actually makes sense to spin up all these sort of like new products to cater towards them. So whether or not Apple ends up acquiring a product like uh, Solana's phone, if it ends up doing well, right? I don't even know if that's going to be possible, 
an acquisition may be even possible, but it will definitely be put be putting more pressure on these corporations. And then maybe that it may introduce a new conversation for, for secondary royalties. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Like, like you brought up this concept of like free to own, right? Like that's only applicable and, and really well executed. Uh, I think at scale when it comes to the mobile side of things, right? We can even talk about like web three mobile and, and web three social and whatnot, but I don't know. Do you think, you think I'm losing you or do you think my head's in the right place? What do you think? I think it makes a lot of sense. I think Solana phone is really interesting. I also love the EthOS project, Ethereum phone, basically doing something very similar. I also think outside of just these kind of mobile native OSs, we're going to see also a more open approach from the consumer side, but also even like from Apple towards web apps versus actual apps on the app store, um, because it's going to be unless Apple does away with the 30% tax, which I don't think is going to happen, it's going to be the best way to actually have mobile native experiences for web three. Um, so I think my other kind of like prediction over the next maybe five years is like, we'll see the rise of more just kind of like web apps for mobile. Um, generally I think web three mobile is a super interesting space though. I mean, even as we saw the shift towards mobile a decade ago, it really shepherded in kind of the, the quote unquote casual consumer. And I think there are a lot of you know, we, we talked about interfaces at the beginning. There are a lot of experiences that are really not possible and will be uniquely unlocked by a mobile native interface. And so step in again, you know, we talked about it, but one of the big reasons it did so well in terms of user acquisition is it was on mobile and, you know, everybody has a phone, even um, this is a web two kind of tangent, but I think Replit launching um, basically like the code editor on mobile is so, so interesting, right? Not everybody has a laptop right. um, and being able to do that on mobile is is so powerful. Um, but other kind of experiences that I think will be uniquely unlocked because of mobile will be things like geolocated NFTs, almost like a Web3 Pokemon Go. So there are companies that are doing interesting things in that space. Mirage is one, my favorite one in this space. And then uh, Dropverse is another super interesting one. I imagine we'll also see a bunch more VR, AR type experiences in the future. I haven't totally figured out my opinion on that at a high level, but um, Jadu is an interesting Web3 AR game and all of these things are mobile native. And then obviously also I think uh, Web3 wallets on mobile are going to continue to be massive. And so Rainbow is one that is already widely used on mobile. The Glow wallet on Solana is interesting. We are investors in uh, kind of like an explorer called Genesis uh, that that's mobile first and really a beautiful consumer experience. It, so I'm, I'm really excited about um, kind of all of these interfaces, but I imagine we've got a little bit of a ways to go until we're really mobile first for Web3 just because of kind of the infrastructure that we have today. So if we keep on building, if we keep on building front ends for a world where data is a commodity in, in blockchain, how do you build stickiness? How do you build defensibility? What does that look like from your perspective? Mm-hmm. This is like the big question, right? Um, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. So I think a big one actually is in brand and in brand equity of perhaps there are token gated experiences for a specific type of experience that you want to have. And that's kind of the moat of, you know, I want to have a certain experience for a certain type of action I'm completing in Web3. Specifically, I think wallets are a very interesting space. I I put out a prediction. I can't believe it was almost a year ago. That's crazy. But it was my 2022 prediction in Mario Gabriel's kind of like what to watch in 2022 for crypto. And I basically said, we're going to see this shift from crypto wallets to Web3 wallets. And kind of how I would explain that shift is generally to date, all wallets have been built and designed around transactions, right? How do I buy and sell and custody tokens. And the wallets that are able to capture specific consumer behaviors at certain points in time will be really successful for that cycle. So for example, in DeFi summer, all you needed to be able to do was to interact with DeFi. You wanted to be able to buy and sell and custody those tokens. And MetaMask was around for DeFi summer and they skyrocketed to, I think, half a million to 10 million users in the span of a year because they were there to capture that consumer demand. Similarly, I think Rainbow is a good example. After DeFi summer came NFT summer and everybody wanted a highly visual way to show and display and explore NFTs as assets in their wallet. MetaMask couldn't really do that, but Rainbow could and Rainbow skyrocketed in users. 
So the story like really doesn't end there. The question now becomes what are going to be, you know, the really big waves of consumer appetite and which wallets are going to be there to capture that demand. And so generally, I think we're just going to see more wallet front ends. So even a, a couple months after I, I wrote that in Mario Gabriel's piece, I put out um, an article on Mirror called Stop Calling It a Wallet, basically saying, and and I'll, I'll preface it, I don't have a better word yet, so don't come at me. <laughs> but I think the word wallet is a little <laughs> bit limiting yeah. because it, it insinuates that the things in your wallet are static and that they're capital assets. And that already is very limiting to how we interact with Web3 and the things that we hold in there. So maybe perhaps, um, again, don't quote me on this. I guess you have to quote me because now I'm going on the record. But yeah, yeah, maybe there's a passport. Maybe if it's a wallet all around digital fashion, there's a better interface for actually trying on digital fashion. And you can browse through the clothes hanging on a rack instead of like a really shitty 2D image like you see on OpenSea. And maybe that wallet is called a wardrobe. Or maybe there's a specific front end for music NFTs exactly. and it plugs into NFTs that were purchased on specific mar- marketplaces that focus on music. And maybe if you bought a glass music video NFT, you can watch the video within the wallet or maybe you can play the songs on a playlist. And so maybe that wallet is called a discography or something. And so, again, I haven't really flushed out a better word because obviously yeah. the word needs to be able to kind of take the thing seriously and it's not something to be taken lightly obviously the, it's like a high value and um you know important thing the, yeah but, the way i see it is like different front ends for different experiences that's how i sort of see absolutely it, right and if like, absolutely like, like you said with music nfts with the rise of of people collecting music nfts with the rise of tokenized audio there is going to be a media player right whether it be spin amp or future tape right that people are tapping into they just act as aggregation layers maybe soon have marketplaces on a, on a mobile front right that they sort of like monetize accordingly based off the attention that people use and listen the, the application for, right? I think there's going to be many, Absolutely. many different, many different instances around that. And I think when now we're tying back curation, playing an even more important role in sort of like showcasing totally. the right assets and the right experiences on that front end in a world where data is so vast and so expansive, right? And when you have indexers popping up left and right for all different types of use cases, it's up to you the creator, the entrepreneur to figure out what type of experience, what type of front end you're going to create for what type of data. I think this is a great place to end off, Gabby. Um, before I let you go, where can we find you? Where can we learn more about your work? Shill it away. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter, Gabby underscore Goldberg. Send me a DM, say hi. I try and respond to most of them. And then I write on mirror, Gabby.mirror.xyz. And First time I've said this, but I'm on Farcaster at Gabby. So maybe you should DM me there instead. Sounds good. Um, but thanks so much for having me. This was so much fun. Thank you so much. We'll have to do this again soon. Till next time.